Thank you guys for letting me come speak to you today. Um, I, I've got a little bit of a background to kind of give you. We're going to play some games. Uh, people like trivia, right? This isn't going to be lecture format. It's going to be more interactive. So I'm going to have you get up and play some games and hopefully learn a little bit about leadership and culture. But I'm going to open up toward the end with a ton of answer questions, right? The, the Q&A is typically what most speakers I notice cram what they think you want to know and then they give you five minutes to ask what you really wanted to know. I kind of flipped that on its head. So my presentation won't be near as long, but I'm going to open it up to answer anything that you guys might have. Okay. So we're going to play a little bit of a game and show you how this works. And I'll just be pointing to those guys in the back to help me out and switch our slides. So I'm Jeremy Williams with Chick-fil-A. I own the location here in Ocala. And I've been in Ocala now. This is my ninth year. So prior to that, I was in Jacksonville, Florida as a Chick-fil-A owner for five years. And I was at the Tinseltown location. If you're familiar with Jacksonville, it's a big movie theater area out there called Tinseltown. So um, my, my wife and family and I moved down here for Chick-fil-A. Uh, we've got a son that's 15, is a sophomore at Forest High School, and a daughter that's 14. She's a freshman at Forest High School. They're 13 months apart, and that was God's sense of humor. So uh, we're very excited, very blessed to have them. So <clears throat> go ahead and go to that next one. All right, so we're going to play a game. We'll, we'll do a little bit of this as we go. That I like to call face-off. And so it's a little bit of an interactive thing, right? So if you guys will stand up for me. <clears throat> that way um, I've got a little bit of a saying, your mind will absorb what your butt will endure, right? So you've been sitting long enough. All you're thinking about is how bad your butt hurts. You're not thinking about what the speaker's saying. So before Chick-fil-A, I had a 10-year career. So you get to choose between one of these three careers. I was an NFL player, Air Force pilot, or a teacher and a coach. So on the count of three, you're going to face the direction of the answer you think is correct. So in other words, if you thought that I was an NFL player, I'd say one, two, three, and you're going to turn and face that direction. Y'all with me? Okay. Those are your three options. So on the count of three, turn which direction you think I was. One, two, three. All right. So I've got teacher and coach. I've got Air Force pilot and not a soul said NFL player. My feelings are not hurt a bit. <clears throat> All right. Who's got a smartphone? You've got one? Do me a favor. I want you to go on and Google Seattle Seahawk wide receiver, 1995 to 2005. So this thing is going to buffer and go around, and then I won't come up because I wasn't an NFL player. <laughs> so thank you for playing anyway, right? I did play college football at Georgia Southern University, um, most known for helping you guys get rid of one of the University of Florida coaches when we beat the Gators in the swamp. That was a great game for us. Um, I am a pilot. Uh, I was not an Air Force pilot, though. I'm a, I'm a private pilot. That's my passion. My grandfather was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force and was a test pilot for 40 years. Uh, so that's where I got my passion for flying. I was actually a teacher and a coach for 10 years in Georgia. All right, so you all can have a seat. Good job for that. So who got that right? Who got the right answers? We got two? All right, so see, you get prizes. Here you go. You got two free meals on me. Great job. So there's always an incentive, guys. Always an incentive. So <clears throat> how in the world do you get to Chick-fil-A from being a teacher and a coach? So I was actually a special education teacher. I taught special needs students for 10 years. I coached high school football, wrestling, and track. And No Child Left Behind came out. And that totally changed the landscape of special education to where I was spending 80 to 90 percent of my time and day in meetings or filling out paperwork. And I realized that my passion, which was teaching and developing others, I was only doing about 10% of the time. So my wife and I had this big long discussion about, I feel like God has uniquely designed me to do something impactful, but I feel like the structure that I'm in, I cannot fulfill what I'm really wired to do. So we went on this journey and we're trying to figure out, okay, what is it, what career do I need to plug into to fulfill what God's purpose is for me? So I actually applied for the GBI, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, went through their physical test, the, uh, the written test, was in the next class to be hired, and Georgia put a hiring freeze on all, on all public jobs. I said, okay, wow, so do we just hang tight and wait for this to open? What do we do? So I was sitting on the beach with a buddy of mine that was uh, in the GBI, left the GBI for Chick-fil-A, and he said to me, why not own a Chick-fil-A restaurant? 
I said, Mark, I've never had a business class. I've never had a marketing class, a finance class. I've never had anything having to do with business. What makes you think I can own a business, much less a restaurant? I've never worked in a restaurant. And he said, skill sets are skill sets, and you can transfer them. Go. So if you're talking about influence, if you're talking about developing people, you can do that owning a restaurant. So it really got my wheels spinning. <clears throat> and so think about it. What's, what, the people have this saying all the time, right? What's the worst thing someone can tell you? If you, if you try out for something, what's the worst somebody can say? You say no? You all have heard that, right? Sometimes the worst thing they can say is yes. And I'll tell you why here in a minute, okay? <clears throat> so I went through the application process. In any given year, over 25,000 people apply to own a Chick-fil-A franchise. We currently only open 90 to 95 per year. So my interview process alone took three years to become a Chick-fil-A owner. And we're talking background checks, interviewing me, interviewing my spouse, really getting in depth with your references. And my best friend from school was an FBI agent in Missouri, and he teases me all the time that it was harder for me to get into Chick-fil-A than it was for him to get in the FBI. <clears throat> and I believe that, right? But it's for what it's what they're looking for, and they have a very specific skill set that they want to run and be in a business partnership with you. So we'll get into that a little bit more. We'll go to the next one. All right, keep going. All right. So I don't think any of you got into being in the fire department for the money. I don't know. You got a twinkle in your eye. It must have, it must have been for the money. Did, did anybody go into public service in a, a government job like public service for the money? Anybody? Does any become, anybody become a teacher for the money? A police officer, a firefighter, a librarian. I mean, anything that you do community service wise, does anyone get into that job for the money? No. Why do they get in those jobs? So you just have a heart for that. You were drawn to that, right? Why did you get into public service? Okay. Why did you get into it? Gave you a purpose. Purpose? Okay. All right. Okay. And so what's fun is if you think about what everybody just said, right? Like to help people have a purpose, in your case, like children. Can you fulfill that in a variety of different jobs? I mean, if you like people, what could you do that you could serve people? Anything other than live on an island by yourself, right? And so one thing that I've said for years, and this gentleman I'm about to show you named Michael Jr. He's a Christian uh, comedy uh, act. If you've not seen his stuff, I encourage you YouTube it. He's hilarious. Um, he did, he did this whole series on Know Your Why. I've been trying to put it into words for a few years, and this three-minute clip I'm about to show you really drives home about knowing your why. So we'll watch a clip on that. He's doing great.
And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny just happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music, you know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just going to show you a clip. Check it. So you're a musical director? Yes, sir. All right, so um, let me get a couple Let me get a couple bars of, like, uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Go ahead. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That rock is sick. You know what I'm saying? time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time I asked him to sing, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what has more impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. That makes sense? I've tried to, I've tried to put that in words for a few years, and then I, there's not a better three-minute clip out there that really Yo, comedian Mike reminate, you know, it, it really drives home what I've been asking and what I've been trying to tell. <clears throat> Do you know your why? And what I find is for most people that are in a public service job, they absolutely know their why. But then we start getting into this leadership part. Like, I'm, I feel like I'm serving my purpose. I knew my why was to help people. So I got into a public service position. But now I'm not so sure I like the structure Leadership is difficult or I want to be in leadership and I don't know how to be a leader or I feel like I'm failing as a leader. And so then that's when kind of the next phase of this, once you have figured out what your why is, how do you fulfill that purpose and do it in a meaningful way? Because I don't know anybody that wakes up in the morning and says, man, I sure hope I fall flat on my face today. Man, I, you know what? I hope the 50 people that I lead have the most miserable day of their life today. I hope when my whole team goes home today, they're cussing me the whole way home. I don't know any leader that wakes up with that as their goal, right? That, that, that's their purpose. But they find themselves in that same thing. And mentally, they're going through. I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not producing enough. I'm not all these things. And it becomes the enemy inside their head, literally giving them a ton of doubt. So there's several things that I get asked to speak about a lot around Marion County. And it has to do with culture. Most people that I talk to say, man, where do you find all these great people to work at Chick-fil-A? And I have a very simple answer, and I say it straight-faced every time. I fire the grumpy ones. And I'm not kidding. Right? I'm absolutely not kidding. It, 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 my goal and what I realized a long time ago, building an organization, when we talk about leadership and, and we're going to kind of camp out on culture for a little bit, you get to set the stage and the tone for what your culture is. You get to define that. Right. And so people, it's funny, they'll spend all this time on these things that they'll put in frames and post on the wall and they'll go up there and they'll keep saying, hey, this is this is who we are. 
But is it the words or the actions that are the most powerful? Which is it? It's actions, right? Anybody that's been around children, you'll know. You can say a hundred things. Your child is going to do what you do, much more so than what you say. And so when you come up with like a corporate purpose or I'm not diminishing that. What I'm saying, though, is be careful that whatever you make as your purpose, you're living it out in your words and actions, more actions than anything. And so when we talk culture, you set the stage for that culture. I decided a long time ago I was not going to go find the pretty cheerleaders with the big white teeth with the spirit fingers and hire them for the front of the house and go get the ugly, grumpy hunchback people and put them in the kitchen. Right. Which is what most people think about in restaurants. Why would I want to create an environment in my kitchen that's already difficult enough and put a bunch of grumpy people back there? What do you think you're going to get from that? Right. So we're just looking for great people. And I'm going to tell you right now, I have let people go consistently that have had a great skill set and they've had a horrible attitude. I cut them out quickly, quickly. Now, I'm not a huge reader at all. When I go to the beach with my family, I'm not sitting under a tent reading a book. I'd rather go throw a football or do something active. But I will tell you a book that absolutely changed my life. Even if you're not a reader, I highly recommend it. It's by a guy named Dr. Henry Cloud, and it's called Necessary Endings. Now, I've had people come up to me a month after I've spoken to a group, say, hey, I don't know if you remember me. I'm so-and-so. You spoke to our group. I hate you. And I'll, and I'll laugh. i say, you got the book, right? If you read this book, here's my caution. Don't get it and don't read it if you're not prepared to have to make decisions. And the premise of this book is, there's all these stages of life that there are necessary endings that have to happen. And it talks about personally, it talks about the psychology behind understanding when decisions have to be made and the psychology behind why we don't. It takes a spiritual angle to it as well. But it is one of the best books that I've ever read, read having to do with making decisions on every area of your life. Marriage with children, with your career and all that. And it dives, again, into this culture piece. So we'll talk a little bit more about culture. If we get flipped the next slide for me. Keep going. So we are very fortunate with Chick-fil-A that we had an amazing, amazing mentor in Truett Cathy. Uh, he passed away four years ago. And Chick-fil-A got to a crossroads where we began in the malls and then we grew into freestanders. But there was a time right in 1980 that Truett had to make a decision on the growth of the business. Now, for those that were around during that time in 1980, that was the highest interest rate ever in the history of our country to borrow money. It was somewhere close to 30%. Truett decided that they, if they were going to expand and take the, uh, all the momentum that they had going, now was the time to do it. And he had to make a decision. He took out a $10 million loan. Think about that now with almost 30% interest at a time where that was expensive money to borrow. And before all that happened, he took his executive team away for a week long retreat and they didn't talk about numbers and they didn't talk about how much chicken they talked about. What is our per What's our why? What is our why? Why do we exist? Why does Chick-fil-A exist? Why are we doing what we do? What is our why? And this is what they came back with from that week long trip was our corporate purpose, which sits right in front of our corporate office today. Every employee that enters and exits every single day of work sees this corporate purpose. Now, what do we just talk about? Are the words on that plaque the most important thing? They're not. What is the most important thing? Acting it out. Here's what I want to encourage you guys to do. If you don't, if you have not come up with your own type of corporate purpose having to do with your culture or what you stand for, it doesn't need to be this, you know, 13 page memorandum kind of deal. But it needs to become your filter. So I want you to really think about that. We're going to talk about decision making here in a minute. This was this was true in Chick-fil-A's vision. Their, their number one thing was to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that's entrusted to us. Every decision they make, 
the first filter they use is what? Is the decision we're making going to glorify God? If the answer to the very first thing that they say, they go, uh, or no, what happens? Done. What's the benefit of having a filter like that? How much time are you spending on stuff chasing your tail, leaders, right? You're chasing your tail, and you're, you're taking a decision. It's almost like the, the round peg in a square hole syndrome where you know in your gut probably not the right way, the right decision, but you feel like you're painted in a corner. And so you almost massage this thing to make it fit. You follow me? Am I the only one guilty of ever doing that? Okay. I, what I love about it is true in the executive committee. Say, if it doesn't glorify God, we're not doing it. About being a faithful steward. The stewardship somewhere on my tombstone. I've already told my family there needs. I need stewardship on my tombstone. That is near and dear to my heart. Most people today, when I bring that word up, have no clue what it means. Who wants to take a stab at it? What is stewardship? All right, it would entail leadership. Sure, you're entrusted to take care of something that's not yours. I mean, if any of us have been, lived long enough to experience deaths in our family or loved ones, you know, they always say there's no U-Haul behind a hearse. And it's true, Right. Everything we have is going to either end up in a dump, believe it or not. The one thing you hold most precious and dear, someday somebody's going to look at you and and throw it in a trash can. Or it's going to get passed around and passed down. Or it's going to end up in a yard sale. What are the two greatest things that we're challenged to be good stewards of? What would you think those two most valuable things today are that most people would say? This is the participation part of the program. All right, family, and that would fit under what I would say time. What's everybody say? What do you guys say every day? You don't have what? I don't have time. What would be the equal, most important thing, probably more important in most people's mind? Money. Okay, time and money. Are we on the same page? All right. You know, the crazy thing about money, you live long enough, you can make it back. You can make the worst financial decision ever. And if you live long enough, you can earn that money back. But over here is this, this thing called time. And how, how much of that are you getting back? You're not. I, I, I feel as a leader, my stewardship toward the finance part of what Chick-fil-A and God has presented me with, I take that as, as a huge task. More so than the money is the time that I'm investing in people and they're investing in me. I, I want to be a great steward of the time that I've been given. And so as we talk about culture, a bad culture, what does that do to your time? It sucks it into a black hole. Now, you were a teacher, ma'am? What grade? Oh, perfect. All right. And, and not in a good way, but 90% of a teacher's attention and time is spent toward the students that are doing the right thing in class or the behavior problems. It's your behavior problems. Think about in your organization, in your culture, if you've got, if, if you could close your eyes and think of one or two faces that are absolutely sucking the life out of you your organization, what would, where else would you better steward that time if they weren't sucking it out of you? And that's a question only you can ask, answer, but I don't know of a person yet that I haven't asked that question to that doesn't smile because they immediately know one or two people that are sucking the life out of their time. True or false? Okay. Get necessary endings. I promise you. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, three buckets. I'm going to try to save you guys a lot of time. So a lot of times when I've talked about that filter and our corporate purpose and what that looks like, we, I, I've tried to figure out I'm a visual person. I, I like pictures and words. Um, 
I, I feel like we wake up every day with three buckets. And one of our buckets is patience. And think about a bucket full of water, right? And th- as the day goes, you're pouring that patience out. So unfortunately for our loved ones, usually by the time we get home, that bucket is what? It's empty. No, no bucket of patience left. And who ends up getting the wrath of a bad day? The family does. The ones who love you the most and have done nothing to you. Right. And so then I also think energy. you got a bucket of energy. And man, you're pouring that stuff out as you go until you get home and that bucket's empty. Guess what? There is gone. I also I put in there grace as a third bucket and you might want to put that as patience. Right. But how much grace you're showing throughout a day, not only to others, but to yourself. But I want to give you three buckets when it comes to decision making. And I hope if you don't get anything else out of the day, this helps you moving forward, no matter how old you are, or how young you are. This has been one of the greatest things to help me be a good steward of my time and my emotional energy. All right. Bucket one is stuff that you cannot control. You have zero control over. Give me some things that you have no control over at all. Give me one thing you have no control over. Traffic. Give me something you have no control over. Accidents. Politics. Other people's opinions. Other people's attitudes. Okay. You have no control. How about weather? Can you control the weather? If not, you're in the wrong business, right? You can make a lot of money. So here's the deal. Think about it. Be honest with yourself. How much time throughout a day are you spending emotional energy, that bucket, and you're pouring it out on things that you cannot control? Mad about it. Frustrated with it. Stomping your feet about it. But you have no control over it. And how much of that bucket are you pouring out that emotional energy into something you have zero control over? If I was going to ask a percentage and you were being honest, what percentage of your time in general would you spend? You spend emotional energy on things you have no control over. 80 percent. OK. 70, 80. You guys. OK. Just like we talked about that teacher spending time with that behavior problem or you had that picture in your mind of that that person that you know that sucks the life out of your day. If we know we're spending 80 to 90 percent of our emotional energy on things we can't control, how smart are we? Not very, because we can't control it. So I'm going to give you guys a filter because I know a lot of people really struggle with coming up with a filter. So this is the one that I use every day. Stuff pops up. First question I ask, can I control it? If the answer to that is no, what do I do with it? Bye. I can't do anything about it. Done. So here's the second bucket. The second bucket is what you have 100% control over. What would those things be? What do you have 100% control over? And I'm going to narrow it down to it's actually only two things. I know a lot of us want to be control freaks. We actually only can control two things. What would that be? Your attitude. And, well, and I would put those together. You're right. And your effort. Your attitude and your effort. Those are the things you have total control over. So if stuff happens, you control your attitude and you control how much effort you put toward it. Then you've got this third bucket and it's the big gray area. And that's what you can influence. So if you can't control it by, you can't control your attitude and your effort. So the next one is, can I have influence over it? So you mentioned politics that you have, there's no control. That actually, I would say, goes into the influence because you, you can at least vote. Now, the outcome is out of your control, but you do get to influence it, right? What other things could you influence? You can influence it, but at the end of the day. You can't control it. And then so what's going to happen? You pour emotional energy into what you can influence. Let's say someone's attitude, right? And they they don't do it. They don't do a thing. They're not listening to you. What bucket do they go into now? 
can't control. And I'm not saying give up on people. Don't hear me say that. Because thank God people didn't give up on me, right? But there is also a necessary ending to where you're going to continue to invest emotional energy into a situation that you have no longer have influence because you cannot control their energy or their attitude. You can influence it. Does that make sense as a filter? Guys, I'll tell you this. When I tell you that I think about that filter at least 100 times a day, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not. So I know when I got into Chick-fil-A, I thought that the heavens parted and angel employees fell out of the earth and my whole restaurant was going to be filled with these just amazing Christian people that woke up in the morning and couldn't wait to be at work and there's a bunch of Mickey Mouses working around, right? And that's, that's the farthest thing from the truth. There's still deaths in families, long-term illnesses, boyfriend-girlfriend issues, people that get thrown out of their house, drug issues, Primarily, you know, pregnancies, all of that exists. And so every day I am faced with things that are happening that I have to say, can I control this? No. I control my attitude and effort. And then over here, I'm going to influence some things. But then I've got to decide when there's a necessary ending. Does that help? All right. Go to the next one. All right. So bus duty. How many of you guys feel like you're doing exactly what you thought you would be doing at whatever stage you're at in life right now, meaning what the job you have was your goal. You wake up in the morning and you say, I'm living my purpose. I'm living exactly what I'm doing, exactly what I wanted to do. OK. OK, there's more to do. I like that. Same for you. How about you guys? Okay. Good feeling, right? Good feeling to wake up. What about you? Same. Same? Okay. So let me ask this. Have you ever found yourself doing a task in your job that you were like, really, I have to do this? Like, I went through all this training. I did all the whatever. You know, I don't even know the extent of what you guys have to go through. I've had employees of ours that have gone through the fire training and, and whatnot. But have any of you gotten to the end of that journey and thought, really, this is what I'm doing? Happened to you? OK, well, bus duty is my example. So went through, got my degree, going to teach special education. I'm now Coach Williams. So excited. I remember showing up to the elementary school. I taught elementary for five years and high school for five years. And I remember showing up my first day of school and I wore a shirt and tie. Didn't have to, but I did. And I was only one of three males in the entire elementary school. And we had 2,800 students in this elementary school. So being Coach Williams was a big deal. I'm going to get to have a lot of influence on a lot of young people. And I am so excited. And we had to be there early for a uh, pre-meeting for the first day. And I get my name called. And I'm like, yes, sir. Mr. Tool is my principal. He said, yeah, forgot to mention to you. You have bus duty in the mornings. So, okay, bus duty, what's, what's that about? Well, come on out here. Well, there's only one way in the school and made a big gigantic loop and one way out. But they needed someone with a college education to stand outside and direct the buses. Y'all follow me? Okay, I don't know how much you know about South Georgia, Sylvania, Statesboro area. It's the nat capital of the world. And it is, it is next to the surface of the sun, the hottest place in the world, with a 1,000% humidity. And I remember going out there day one, and I am drenched. And I am miserable. And I got gnats in my ears. And this is way before I started getting a little bit more mature in my thought process. And I'm thinking, are you freaking kidding me? I went through all I went through to get through college. And I am bus duty guy. Y'all ever find yourself in that place? Okay. Go back to my three buckets. I wish I'd have known this then. What bucket did that go in? Can't control it. That's what I'm assigned to do. What could I control? Attitude in my effort. And then I could influence, right? 
So I, here's the one thing I remember thinking. I've got 179 more of these days. <laughs> I'm serious. I, literally in my mind. Some of you guys have a calendar that you're checking off. Like 53 days to retirement. Or 52 more days of this job. Or whatever that is. And, and you just can't wait to get to the end. You're just trying to make it through. And I want to challenge that thinking. I think it's sad when I hear people talk about only this many days until it's over. Because I feel like they're wasting a great opportunity between the beginning and the end point to influence. Right. So here I am on bus duty and I'm just being me. Right. Waving at the bus drivers as they pull in. Hey, guys, good morning. Hey, good morning. How many bus drivers wave back? I don't know what their day was like, but it must have been awful. And I can only imagine being on a bus with 50 screaming kids, right? I didn't have a single bus driver way back. Not one. Okay. I decided in that moment that I got to find a way to motivate me to do 179 more of these moments. Because there are going to be days it's raining, and I'm still out there. There's days it's going to be freezing cold, and I'm still going to be out there. So I got to I got to change me. I got to change my attitude. What I knew is I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. That's why I got into special education and coaching. My why is very similar to what I heard you guys say. I wanted to impact lives in an amazing way. That's my deal. Impact lives in an amazing way. You can impact lives and it'd be terrible. I want to do it in an amazing way. So here was what I did. What do you think my goal was after day one of bus duty? I want every, I was mad. By the end of this year, that gummy, every bus driver will wave back to me. I don't care what it's going to take. That was my new challenge. Every morning when I woke up, I brushed my teeth. Literally, I'm having conversations in there. Today's the day. They are waving back. What does that do when you create a focus and a purpose for yourself? What does that do? It gives you drive. Right. It gives you a reason to get up and go. So I got up and I started to decide, OK, I got to up my game. So I'm going to get a little more animated. So I'm waving both hands. Hey, good morning. Hey, yeah, good morning. You know what happened? I had like three bus drivers wave at me. I, dude, I, that was progress, right? I didn't go in deflated. I was like, I got three today. That's kind of working. So I went the next day, got even more animated. I got the most animated I've been. Man, I even had someone give me the one finger off the steering wheel. I didn't count that. Right? I didn't, they didn't give me the middle finger, thankfully. I got the one finger off the steering wheel. I was like, no, nah, that didn't count. I want a full wave. The hands got to move. Right? So then have we got our mic on right here. So then one morning I said, okay, I'm going to up my game. I'm like, okay, you're doing all this stuff ain't going to work. So this is what I did. See if I can get this to work. Come on. Can y'all hear that at all? It looks red. Anyway, I I got some music playing, man. Oh, I hey, I put my headphones on and I'm standing at the bus duty and I'm getting my groove going, boy. I was banging down. What's up? What's up? I get it down. Y'all follow me? Okay. What do you think happened after that? What do you, what do you happen when they saw the effort yeah. that was going into not just being here, but actually caring about my job? What do you think happened? All right. I started getting, you know what happened? I was blown away. They didn't just wave. They started honking the horn. Man, right? Kids start hanging out the bus window. Hey, guys, where are you? They're getting screamed at. It was awesome. Get back in the bus. Oh, it was great. It was great, right? But here's the deal, guys. Here's when I knew I made a difference, right? Remember, my goal was kind of selfish, get them all the way back. But my purpose was to make an amazing difference in people's lives, right? Have an amazing impact. I had an early morning teacher-parent meeting. My principal found me later that day, said, hey, I just want you to know we had a dozen or so bus drivers call the school today because you weren't at bus duty to see if you were okay. That that was the, oh, wow. That was the wow. So here's the deal. You're going to find your seat sometimes where you don't want it to be. You're going to be given a task you don't want. 
You didn't expect. In your mind, I've worked too hard to be doing this. I, I should be way past doing this. Not that you're too good for it, but you've worked too hard to be in that spot. Go back to what your filter is, what your purpose is, and have meaning in that purpose, right? So how many of you guys feel like you've been in that bus duty spot before? You have? Okay, stand up. Okay, you're on bus duty. This is for a week's worth of free Chick-fil-A meals and a big cow. I, I, I need to see your best bus duty moves. Oh, Moody's got to go. Are y'all too good for chicken? This is a week's worth of chicken, guys. A week's worth of chicken. Oh, it's absolutely. Absolutely. Who's got the best moves? I'm seeing some YMCA kind of shuffle moves. Oh, we, we got, we got the tandem. We got the tandem going back there. All right, very good. All right, I'm going to let y'all sell police. Who want it? Who y'all giving it to? They, are they getting it? All right. Here you go. Good job. There you go. No, y'all can fight over it later. There you go. All right. So y'all follow me on the bus duty thing? All right. Go ahead and flip that next one for me. So soft skills. Who, who knows what soft skills are? Because I, I promise you this. I hear this all over the community. Every employer out there keep, continually says, we cannot find a workforce that has soft skills. What do I mean by that? All right. I'm going to tell you our core four, and those are basically soft skills. Okay? We actually, I think it's sad that we have to do this, but we're actually having to teach employees in the door. Eye contact. That's, that's one of the core four. You've got to make eye contact. All right. Now, again, let's do this under the premise of culture. Y'all follow me? If you want your culture to be one of outgoing, caring people and those kind of things, these soft skills are the top of the list of what your team has to have and possess. And if they're important to you, you better be training on them. You better be have it as a standard and you better hold to accountability. So we talk about eye contact. How important is eye contact today? What is the anti-eye eye contact that we have going on? Right there. You watch it with families in my dining room constantly at the table, and they don't even talk to each other. I think they're texting across the table to one another. How was your day? My day was fine. Right? That's exactly right. So when we talk about soft skills, that's honestly what we're talking about. Making eye contact, sharing a smile. Smiles are contagious, guys. They, they, they are more contagious than the flu. I could take somebody to smile. See, you didn't want to smile. You didn't want to do it, man. You didn't either. Look at that. Golly, I even got teeth out of you. Look at that. Oh, there they are, right there. Smiles are contagious, right? So eye contact, share a smile, speak enthusiastically. Now, I, I pick on ladies all the time when I talk about the speak enthusiastically part. It, those of you that are in relationship, does your partner know whether or not you're enthusiastic about the answer you just gave them? Oh, yeah. Tell me about your day. Oh, it was a horrible day. It was an awful day. It was an, well, that's, uh, okay, yeah, all right. That's good. What's, what do you want for dinner? Are, are you really engaged with them? Are you speaking enthusiastically? If you want to see it in full display, go to the Paddock Mall and watch two young ladies see each other from the opposite sides of the food court. They lose their ever-loving mind, Right? screaming, running toward each other. Ah, they hug, they jump around in circles. They can speak enthusiastically. And what's amazing when I see that kind of stuff go on, I don't know those people, but I want to get to know them. Because if you like that person so much that you'll lose your mind like that, they must be a pretty cool person to know. All part of soft skills, right? And then this is my favorite my Justin Bieber imitation right there. Stay connected. Staying connected is a thing of the heart. So when I teach at the groups, we literally work our way down. Eye contact, share a smile, speak enthusiastically, and stay connected. The whole art of that soft skill is what's missing predominantly across the board right now. Now, you guys, what would you say if you boil down what your service that you provide, what would it be? 
What is the service? We're in the customer service business at Chick-fil-A. Happens to be a restaurant. What is y'all's business? I don't know. 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 Are, are you showing up typically on people's best day or the worst day? And how important are those soft skills in dealing with those situations? Huge, right? How important is the culture in the firehouse? Right? So I'll give you another test on whether or not you've got somebody that's in your culture that you may not want. You could try to influence or might need to move on. Think about in your mind's eye, is there a person that you don't dare ask, hey, how's your day going? Y'all have anybody like that? See, I, I used to screw up all the time and my greeting, I really messed this up and I really had to catch myself. I would be walking by somebody and go, hey man, how you doing today? But what did I keep doing? I kept walking. Did I really care how they were doing today? I, I should have just said what? Good morning. So I caught myself because here's what happened. I ran into John all the time that I'd be going by. Hey, man, how you doing today? And guess what John would do? He would tell me. And was it ever good? Oh, I got to hear about all his medical problems and all his other problems and his financial problems. And, it, and just got to the point where there's certain people I don't even ask. How you doing today? This is just me. I want to influence people's lives and I do my best to pour into people to get them out of whatever that is they're in. But if, if it's beyond me, I stay as far away from those folks as I can stay. I, I do not want them tainting my well. And there's only so much energy and time and optimism that I have throughout a day. So I do listen to folks and I do try to help them with their problems and all that. But if you've got that person that no matter what you do, y'all know what I'm talking about? So my favorite poster I just saw recently, what's that old saying? You can take a horse to water. Okay, I saw a variation of that that was hilarious. You can take a horse to water, and sometimes it'll poop in it. Right? Look, I'm not talking about the people that just won't go to the water and won't drink. I don't want them pooping in the well for everybody else. And you've got some of those people in your organizations when we talk about culture, that that's them. I, I'm going to tell you, influence it. Try to try to change it, but if they don't want to change, the best thing you can possibly do is get them out of your organization. Get them out as far out as you can. Make sense? All right. <clears throat> we got a game and stuff we're going to play at the end, but I wanted to open up to any questions you guys have specifically about leadership. Anything about Chick Fil A? I don't care. I mean, I'm not a real private person. I'm pretty wide open. What can I answer for you guys? Yeah, so um, we throw out a net as far and wide as we can. Think about a fisherman, right? And I used to do, I've learned some tricks of the trade even through the interview process. In my industry, you got to be able to move. It's fast food, it's not slow food, right? So I learned that I need people that are aware, meaning they see an elderly couple coming in the door, their heart is naturally wired to open that door, right? So if you own, I'm going to give you two businesses or one business, two candidates. If you owned a tree climbing business, okay, I know it doesn't exist, but just go with me. Would you hire a squirrel or a horse? Why? Okay. You wouldn't hire a horse and then spend your lifetime trying to get that horse to climb that tree? Man, just think about it though. Wait, 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 before you answer that. If you could get that horse to climb that tree, how rich would you be? <laughs> yeah. Think about that, right? Come on now. If, if Couldn't you open up a show? Hey, come see my climbing ho tree horse. Yeah. Oh, there was an if. Yeah. It was an if, wasn't it? Mm. Which one are you going to hire? Squirrel. 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 Squirrel? 
okay, I got my horse here, my tree climbing business. How much time am I going to be spending on this horse? Every moment of my day. And it may or may not ever climb that tree. That squirrel, it's in a cage. What do I have to do? Open the, do I have to do another thing? Okay, so to your point, if I said core four right there, that's the core of soft skills and what we need in order to be in the, the public eye, right? What am I looking for right off the bat during the interview? Do I want to spend the rest of my time trying to teach you to make eye contact with people? I don't want to do it. I, I'm, I'm talking to a horse. Literally, my HR director, I've got a full-time HR director. That's her filter. And I tell her all the time, are you interviewing horses today or squirrels? And whatever it is that your task is, right, you know what your core essentials are. They have to possess this. And if they don't, listen, I've interviewed thousands of very nice people, nice people. But I knew they were not a good fit for what we do. They weren't. And so I didn't move on. I made those mistakes early. I hired just really nice people and I fell flat on my face in my business because they were not wired to move fast. So one thing, I, one of the things I used to do in our restaurant when we weren't as busy as we are now and I could actually interview in the restaurant, I would actually put a couple uh, napkins on the floor between where we were going to start and we were going to end our interview. And so when a candidate would come in, I would purposefully not be up front so that an employee would meet them. And I would see if they walked in and said, yeah, I'm here for an interview. Uh, who are you interviewing with? Uh, I don't remember some guy. What do you think? Strike one or great candidate? Strike one. OK. And then by me not being right there, my team member gets a first take and initial interaction with this person. Then they sit the person on one side of the restaurant. Then I come out. What am I what am I checking for when I come introduce myself? Sitting up. Do they stand up? Do they shake my hand? Do they introduce themselves? And then I purposely say, hey, if you don't mind, we're going to go to this back corner. It's a little quieter back here. And I move at a pace, a pace that I know I need an employee to move at. What happens if I get to where I'm going and I've already sat down and they're still slowly making their way? What do you think? I, that, that, I, I know before they've ever said anything, they're not a good fit for us. And then if they just flat walk past, I'm not talking about a dirty napkin at their work. Napkins on the floor. They don't stop to pick them up. What do you think? Not happening. I've literally watched candidates after an interview merge with an elderly couple at the door. And they bull their way through the door first. Do I expect that I'm going to be able to put some magical training into them that's going to change their heart? No. So I think you have to be very clear and you know the skill set you need for what you do. And then you build from that. I will take a person with the right cultural fit that puts others first over a amazing skill set. And guys, that's, is that not all over sports? How many super Terrell Owens? Right. Chad Johnson, Ocho Cinco. Go, go down the list of these high profile, amazing, talented, God gifted athletes. But their attitudes were terrible and they blew up every team they were a part of. Right. I'd rather take somebody with the right culture and a less skill set. What else? Ask away. <laughs> Right. So I, it goes from the top down. Uh, that's why my interview process was three years long. They wanted to get to the core of am I interviewing a horse or a squirrel? Uh, you know, you, you can I equate it to dating. Honestly, the interview process is dating. Right. I, man, you, you show up for that first date and you look your best and you put on a little extra cologne and you're opening the doors and you're really trying to date right 
And then as time goes on, the real person kind of shows up, don't they? Eventually, doesn't, doesn't the real person show up? So we do three interviews. I mean, you'd be amazed that really you do three interviews for a fast food job. Absolutely. Because just about anybody can fake a first one. You can semi-fake a second, but by the third is usually when you're at a comfort level, you think you're already in the door. And I can tell you countless times that by the third interview, that's the one that gets them. Because one, they don't remember the stories they told you in the first two, so they don't stay consistent. And we have three different people interview them. So all of us pull together and talk about what were your red flags. Well, she told me she was only going to be in Ocala six months. Six months. She told me she planned on getting married and living here the rest of her life. Then the other person says, well, she told me she wasn't even sure where she was going. She was going to follow her boyfriend anywhere he went. Okay, we're done. That person doesn't even know where they are. Now, I will tell you the last count, no exaggeration, we interview 75 people for every one hire we make. It is We have a full-time HR director. My wife fills in because we get backlogged on stuff. And then I'm also a part of that process. Just at my location on 200. The, at, at the heaviest we've been, we had 127 employees in one store. During our busy season we just came off of, we'll have 43 people on the clock at one time. So is it not important that you have the right culture if you got 43 people around each other in that pressure cooker of an environment? It, it, I'm telling you, it's going to expose character very quick. So it, it goes from the top down. It's what are my expectations? Now, this is kind of one of those things, and I'm going to step on toes on this, right? In my case, are you willing to wash dishes to protect your culture? Now, I had to, I had to practice what I'm preaching to you today. I washed dishes yesterday for six hours because we let somebody go. Because it was their second time late. They weren't in full uniform. It was an excuse after an excuse after an excuse. And I literally am standing there going, my calendar is full, but I have got to make a cultural decision today. Right now, like every spotlight in my face, I felt like in the kitchen. I can either turn the other cheek and just, I don't want to do this today. Yeah, go ahead. What do I do to my culture when I do that? What happened to the guy that I sent home to shave? That now I'm going to let this person go because the busyness of the moment, I'm now going to bend my culture, bend my standards. Absolutely. And what do we say? It's not what's on a plaque. It's what you do. And I can talk about the Chick-fil-A standard all day long. If I don't live it and I'm not willing to wash dishes to preserve it, hang it up. And that, that's a hard one, y'all. I don't, I don't want to wash dishes every day for six hours, not because I'm too good for it, but that's not my purpose in my role, right? But I am willing to do it to preserve my culture. So I think that's really at the heart of what you got to decide. When you decide what that purpose is, you decide what your standards are, at all costs, you maintain them. At all costs. Even if it means being shorthanded. We had, and this is this will be another telling one. We had three daytime upfront people who decided to band together and walk out and quit a week before the busiest part of our season started because they were being held to the standard. And so they thought, well, they're not going to let all three of us go at one time. They're fixing to be in the holiday season. There's no way. Job market's tight. You're not going to find the Chick-fil-A people. They dug their heels in the ground and decided that the tail was going to wag the dog. And we said, here, I'm going to go get you a piece of paper. You can write at your notice right now. And they're gone. That was on a Monday morning at 6 o'clock in the morning. We had to redo the entire schedule. We had to call people in to get it covered. I had to pay out overtime. But here's what I will tell you. Within a week's amount of time, I had employee after employee coming to me saying thank you. I can't tell you how nice it is to not work next to that person that all they did was complain. I didn't even know that they were complainers. 
but they were relieved. This was one of the smoother holiday seasons from the standpoint of morale that we have ever had. And if you'd have asked me before that day, I'd have said that would have been a nightmare and disastrous and, oh man, we're in trouble. It was the best thing that happened to my staff. So don't be afraid of losing people that are not a part of your culture. So I hope that answers your question because I think most of the men and women that are Chick-fil-A owner operators all fill into that shoe. I mean, they, they, we all have bought into that um, to an extent. I mean, when I get complaints, I hear we're the worst Chick-fil-A in the United States. So, I mean, we're not always getting it right, I promise. In all these organizations, they grow. So my first store in Jacksonville, Florida, I took over with 22 total employees, and we did $1.4 million my first year. And I was working 100 hours a week, no, no exaggeration, trying to build the culture and hire people and get it going. If I look at my 14-year career, this year we did just under $8 million in sales with 123 employees. That's a heck of a journey, right? That's a long way to go. So I've had to, I've had to restructure how I do leadership, how I think about myself, my role, but the standard hasn't ever changed. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Our president said this, Tim Tisopoulos. He said, techniques will change over time, but principles don't. So if you think about it, true at Kathy, when Chick-fil-A started, did he have any clue that mobile ordering would even exist? Right? Online catering order, third-party bite squad delivery. Do, do you think he thought of any of that when this whole Chick-fil-A thing kicked off? But I can tell you this, the principles of Chick-fil-A are alive and well. The, the tactics and how we do those principles has to change. Right? So that's through the interview process. That's what we're looking for. And I'm looking for people to give them buy in. So that's not a command and control model. It's what we call a high performance leadership team. Now, this is the interesting part. We learned a lot of lessons. So all of you are different age groups and different stages of life. But I'm going to make you all the same equal. So you're all directors at my store. OK. And I'm going to throw something out on the table that I need you guys to come to agreement on and implement something different. So we're only getting 80 cars an hour through the drive-thru. I need you guys to come up with a plan to get 100 cars an hour through the drive-thru. And you're all equals. How well does that work? Y'all already shaking your head no. Why no? Yeah. Yeah, on paper it looks great, right? On paper you would think you would throw out this brilliant idea and you would be going, Oh yeah, why don't we just add this? And you go, Oh, that's brilliant. Let's just add this. And you would think everybody just gets to throw their little piece of the recipe and then we live happily ever after, and that's not how that works. And it was in full display when Chick fil A changed uniform colors. Y'all ready for this? And I had this high performance leadership team model. And I had seven directors sitting around a table at our offsite office. And I said, all right, guys, you get ownership in this. We can do red shirts or, or uh, red shirts or blue shirts, black pants or gray pants. Y'all decide. I don't want to decide. Y'all decide. How well did that go? What do you think? You wanted blue shirts and you had your reasons why. And you wanted black pants and... Black and blue, you shouldn't wear those together and shouldn't do whatever after Labor Day and whatever all the rules are with, with colors and blah, 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 right? And I'm listening to this thing go on and on. I'm thinking, okay, but the book said eventually they'll come to a respectful agreement and never got there. So it turned into me saying, enough, kind of like when you're driving in the car. So here's your example, ready? You're in your family car and it's Friday night. Think about when you were a kid or whatever. And the dreaded question gets asked. Where do you want to go eat? Everybody can understand this example. The first person always says, I don't care. And then it's battle Rama with the three people that are left. I want pizza. I want Chinese. I want Golden Corral. I, and, and here they go. Fight, fight, fight. And eventually, everybody's mad. Right? Dad typically is the one. Dad, gummit, we're going to Golden Corral. 
And then the first person that said they didn't care says, I had Golden Corral for lunch. Is that y'all's car too, right? Okay. Whoa. Teacher's pet. So that's a little bit of how a high performance leadership team kind of works. So what I learned is I have to have what I call a gavel decision maker. I've got to have somebody break the tie. <coughs> but I allow input and I allow thought and I allow passionate opinions. <coughs> Excuse me. Because I want you to have buy in. You've you got to have buy in or it won't work. So I do hire people that I, over time I learn to trust. I've got to give them rope. I've got to give them money. My famous saying to my team is, you're going to make a million mistakes and I'll never yell at you. Don't make the same mistake a million times. If you keep making the same mistake, then there's a different problem. Now, I do hold my people when they make decisions to a standard, which is accountability. Now, if you want to get a room of people to shut up really quick when everybody's talking about standards and all this and they get going with that. Oh, thank you. See, that what a servant's heart right there, man. Meeting needs. Thank you. Have everybody talk about their standards for a while. Have every talk. But if I gave you your list of what is required for your job, timeliness, we won't tolerate people that are rude. Tell me what else y'all have. Okay. I like that. Back of trash. Okay. And so I'll, I'll ask a team of people, give me, give me for your organization, throw out your standards and then I'll get the whole room to be quiet by saying, okay, what's accountability look like with your group? Dead silence. Get a group of Chick-fil-A owners in a room. We have markets, right? In Jacksonville, there were 22 Chick-fil-A's in Jacksonville. I had six within three miles of my store. Go ahead and have a standard even with Chick-fil-A owners about pricing and what we are going to do and not going to do with schools and whatnot and have people not follow that and then ask the question, what does accountability look like? I'm going to tell you 99% of the time of any organization I've ever spoken to, if they've asked me to come in and kind of be a semi-consultant, 99% of the time the root of all evil is there is no accountability. None. Even in churches. No accountability. Everyone knows that person is not doing their job. Everybody knows they're not pulling their weight. Everybody knows they come late and leave early. Everybody knows, but there's no accountability. That's the one thing I will tell you. Look at your organizations. Come up with your filters. Come up with your purpose. But if you do not come back with strong accountability to the level that you're willing to wash dishes to save that culture, you're wasting your time. And it will never change, guys. Never. It's not going to change by accident. So accountability for us, if I'm going to entrust you to make decisions, that's fine. When my folks make mistakes, they pay for their mistake. So if you're in charge of our truck order and you didn't order properly, I'm not going to be mad at you. But our distribution center is in Orlando, an hour and a half away. You're going to have to figure it out. We're not going to be out of catch up long. Well, I'm off today. I was planning on X, Y, and Z. Uh, we, we're out of catch up. I, I suggest you rent a van or do something, but you're going to Orlando. If I have someone who's not willing to be held accountable for their role and responsibility, they will not be with us. Not. Because you will forever be the cleanup on aisle three guy. Forever. And then live in a world of frustration. That, that hands down, 99% of it is accountability. Have you clearly communicated what it looks like? Before anyone takes on a leadership position with me, we have a very long conversation. And they understand, look, I don't care if you were going to the zoo and you had all this plan. If, that doesn't mean you have to be the one, but you better figure it out. I'm not making the calls to get somebody to get that product to the restaurant. That is your responsibility. And in the moment that they balk at that and they're not going to fulfill what they're supposed to do, they're not in it. Does that level of accountability exist in your organization? And if it doesn't, if you're thinking about this now, got the juices flowing, what percentage of that is your frustration?
What does peer accountability look like with your team? Okay. If you got your team in a room and there are 10 of you, would there be any shock if everybody mentioned the same name of the person that wasn't pulling their weight? Okay. Then what is the team doing with or about that person? Uh, again, that's so did it say the corporate purpose was glorify God by living with people that don't pull their weight? And what's the greatest fear of why we don't make that decision? Why don't you think people confront things like that? Her feelings. All right, so let me help you on that. Me being the bleeding heart guy that I was, especially being a spe special ed teacher, right? My, my mantra going into special ed was, give me, you're tired, you're sick, you're weary, and I'm going to change the world. I wanted every kid that every other teacher said they could not get through. Because uh, to your point, right, I'm envisioning this kid being up on a stage receiving some kind of big award one day. If I'm being truthful to you guys, and saying, I owe all this to Coach Williams. He's the one guy that believed in me, right? And I'm thinking, man, I'm going to have those tears running down my face. I'm going to have that proud moment. And, man, that's why I'm doing this, right? And if I'm being honest, yeah, I was doing it to change their life. But I was also, man, I was just yearning for that recognition, too. I wanted to be that guy. I, I started a business in Chick-fil-A with the same mentality and took on a bunch of misfit toys. And realized very quickly, I cannot run an organization with a ton of project people. I just can't. Now, I employ and I always will. I'm going to have one or two or even three people that have special needs. I will have them in my organization. And those are my projects. Those are the people I'm pouring into that they're going to have a home for life. And I'm going to pour into them tirelessly. Right. And I will gladly do it. But I refuse to drag that horse to my pond and have it poop in it. I'm just not. And I think what happens is we feel like, well, if I give up on that person and, and we go down all those things you just said, here's what I, I finally came to terms with. For every person that I'm holding on to, and I can look in the mirror and say, I've done everything I can to make this work. And it's, it's not me. It's them. That is a position that someone else is going to be blessed with. Every time. So for every person that's been terminated because they just refuse to take what's being poured into them, someone else has taken that job that needed it. And so I really changed my mindset to thinking if I'm holding on to people that don't need to be a part of my organization because I, I want it to be a blessing to them, but they're not receiving it. Somebody else will welcome that blessing. And I think that helped me get through that struggle that I was having. The team I have now, I promise you this, if you took all 100 employees we have and sit them in this room and you ask them the question, would you rather be shorthanded and get rid of negative attitudes or be fully staffed? They'll say shorthanded all day because they have more energy, not listen to complainers. Cutting people loose, guys, is not an easy thing. And I will tell people all day, I've never fired anyone in 14 years. They fired themselves. Because they knew the standard going into it. We were very clear with expectations and communication through the process. And there's no surprise. It's not like everybody's told them, pat on the back, great job, great job. And then one day they get called in the office and said, hey, we appreciate your time with us, but your, your services are no longer needed here. I mean, I've got some teenagers pretty hard-headed. I got one guy not long ago... Um, I told him, if, if you don't do X, Y, and Z, you will not be here. And I made him repeat it back to me. What did I just tell you? Do you understand the expectation? Yes, sir. Not the next day, the same exact thing happened. I pulled him in the office. I said, man, I want to congratulate you. He said, yeah, for what? I said, you just got promoted to being a customer. And I gave him a coupon. 
And I said, your next meal is free on me, but you're not working here anymore. You just got promoted to customer. And he's like, what, what, what? What does that mean? You don't work here anymore. What? What did I tell you yesterday? I mean, it's inconvenient. I got home late for dinner. I had to change the schedule. But I'm either going to stand by the standard or I'm not. Yep. If you do not take emotion out of it, you will not make the best choices for your business. Now, there's here's this is the funny part. I'm going to ask you guys, you have to pick. You can't tell me you're in the middle. You're results oriented or you're relationship oriented. You have to pick which one are you. So who here is results oriented? All right. Who's relationship oriented? <coughs> okay. Do you know why we need you? Yeah. If it were just us, everybody would go home crying every day. Yeah. And so you need that mix in your organization. You, you, you've got to have the mix. Now, I went into this thing being the emotional relationship guy, and my business absolutely was failing. I started having to take the emotional attachment out of it and look at it strictly as business decisions, black and white. That, now, listen, that doesn't take the humanity out of it. So here, here my heart on this. <clears throat> I've got two employees right now whose dad's about to pass away. Do, do I walk in the door and wonder why they're not performing to our standard today? I know exactly why they're not. Do you think we tell them, hey, go take a couple days off. Don't worry about the pay part. We're going to take care of you. You need to be with your dad. There's a human element here that you, you don't want to get away from. But if all is right in the world and there's not a legitimate reason, you do need to know your people. But I'm sorry, if Sally has an issue the last seven months she's been with you and it's always something, it will always be something with Sally. And so I think that's where you have to use discernment. So, no, don't take the humanity out of it and don't take caring out of it. But I think sometimes we, we fail to realize letting people go sometimes is the best thing you could do for them. I know we're about out of time, so any other questions? I'll have two parting thoughts for you if you're ready for that. All right. How many of you guys strive to be average? Anything wrong with average? Somebody's got to be average, right? Okay. Okay. Come up here for me real quick. Tell me your name again. Tanner. Tanner. Okay. I want everybody to congratulate Tanner. Tanner today is going to get an award from Chick-fil-A for being average. Okay. So Truett defined it a little bit different. Okay. Tanner. Now think about the definition. You ready? Tanner is the best of the worst we have in class today. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. Tanner, congratulations on being the best of the worst in class today. Congratulations. All right. Come on up here, brother. Tell me your name again. Okay. He, Tanner was the best of the worst. But Brandon, on the other hand, Brandon, congratulations. You're the worst of the best we have in class today. Congratulations to you. Congratulations. So I don't know how many of you are going to put that trophy up on your mantle. I'm the best of the worst or I'm the worst of the best. But that is what average is. And I disdain average. I don't want to be an average husband, average dad, average business owner. There's nothing that I do in my life that I aspire to be average, right? So if that is not what you want to be, then you have to set a standard and hold to that standard or you're going to accept that. Does that make sense? So in that same token, I'll show you guys. Would you say that typically Chick-fil-A, the way we do business is average? Okay. So we have the second mile service initiative where you know we were the ones starting to come out to tables and check on people and uh, hospitality language. Uh, we don't have drinks. We have beverages. We don't uh, refill. We refresh. So 
there's just a lot of different things. You could say, well, that's just words, but the heart behind it also has to come with it. So me coming to your table, sir, I can't refresh your beverage. Just feels different than you need to refill on your drink. Same thing, but it feels different, right? And so, again, that's what we call second mile. Uh, Dan Cathy came up with this. It's a biblical principle. Bible, it talks about Roman soldier would require anyone to have to carry their sword and their stuff for a mile. And Christ said, if they ask you to do it a mile, I tell you, take it a second mile. So for us, the first mile is the food is hot. You get what you ordered. The restaurant is clean. That's what you expected. The second mile part for us is putting all the things in there you wouldn't expect. You didn't expect someone to come to your table at a fast food restaurant and clear your table or refresh your beverage or show up at a event with cows and all that, all the stuff that happens. So Chick-fil-A is very much a second mile service company. And so I like to use the cows as an example of that. Does anybody know what our very first mascot was? This is your big trivia of the day. We had Doodles the chicken. Doodles was this ratty looking dude. I, I think I've got him on a slide up there somewhere. You can slide through and find Doodles for me. <clears throat> Keep going. Keep going. Let's go. Well, right there. There's Doodles. Doodles the chicken. What was wrong with having Doodles the chicken as a marketing plan? There it is, right? You got all these kids. Mama, this is the greatest chicken sandwich in the world. And here comes doodles to your table. Oh, I'm eating doodles. Right? So we got away from doodles to chicken and went to the cow campaign, which is now in, believe it or not, its 20th year. Um, two years ago, I didn't even know this existed, that there's a mascot hall of fame. Never knew it existed. And the Chick-fil-A cow was inducted with Tony the Tiger. So how about that, right? I mean, Tony the Tiger is pretty much global, right? That's great. And so we came up with these cows. And so I'm just going to give you guys an example of what could be average. And then you have within your power to make it not average, right? So we, we've got these little, we call them mini moose. Oh, they're cute, right? And so you know, the reality with this, I challenged my team for an entire year. They had to give out a thousand of these a month thousand of them that's a lot of money was it the mini moo that was the big difference maker what was the big difference maker okay so here's the how do you take a bunch of teenagers knuckle dragon boys that can just grunt and moan right now right and how do you get them to engage in conversation utilize core four and get the heck away from themselves and start thinking about others Hand them a little stuffed cow and say, I need you to go present this to somebody. Go make their day. It's a prop. And so they would actually have to go up to somebody and say, sir, how are you? I'm Jeremy. What's your name? Andrew. Andrew, today's your lucky day, Andrew. We got a special cow for you. Less than Andrew remembering the cow, he's going to remember that somebody took the time to have a personal connection with him. Right? So, look, we could stuff them in a bag. It's not hard to give away a 1,000 cows. I can stuff them in every bag that goes out our drive through We have 5,000 customers a day that come through our store, 5,000. I could, I could go through 5,000 cows a day. It has nothing to do with the cow, all right? So you take an average cow and you connect it up. Well, we go, okay, well, we got to do better than that. We come up with a bigger cow, right? Because that's average. This is definitely not average. Now you got the big cow going. Well, then we say, well, that's not good enough either. I heard somebody talking about it earlier. Man, let's hook a parachute up to these dudes and let's parachute cows down. Y'all follow me, right? And so you go, well, that's still, that's not good enough. So, you know, again, we always think bigger and better and we got to do better stuff. So I said, okay, well, why don't we take a t-shirt cannon and why don't we load this joker up and why don't we have some fun and start blasting cows out to people, Right? So you take what was average and you have fun and use creativity and make it the most non-average thing that you can think of, which is why you guys are still talking about cows being parachuted out of the dome and the big blimp going around because it wasn't average, right?
So that's just that's my encouragement to you guys. Guys, this leadership journey is not easy. It is not. I mean, it's it's the farthest thing from it. We can talk it all day long. Living it is a whole nother deal. Uh, it's definitely got its days. I'm not going to lie where I leave the restaurant and think I'm never going to turn my car back around and go back there. There are those days. And a leader that tells you that doesn't exist for them, they're lying. Because all of us have had it. It's a long journey. It's a marathon. Take, put your oxygen mask on you. Make sure you're reading. Make sure you're developing you. Make sure you're doing hobbies and things that can pour into your buckets. Because if you start your morning without half patience in your bucket, it's going to be a long day. Right? And then my last famous one I'll leave you with is another one of my favorite posters I've seen recently where it's kind of a self-check. And it said, if you run into, and I'll clean it up, if you run into a, a, a butthole during the day, you ran into a butthole. If you run into a butthole all day long, you're the butthole. And that was a clean version. That is a good self-check for all of us, right? If you've gotten halfway through your day and you feel like the world's against you and everybody you've run into is a problem, it might be you. Take a deep breath, redirect yourself, go back to what your purpose is, and see if your day doesn't change. All right? Thanks for letting me come hang out with you guys. I really appreciate it.